Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Grev, and welcome to episode 10 of the Rip Raw and Reds podcast. Unfortunately, this evening, you have got just me. Jace is working hard away in Oslo as we talked to him yesterday in our preview pod. So I'm going to be running through uh, the game that we just watched. It was Arsenal Crystal Palace. Arsenal uh, scraped through for the last 30 minutes with a 1-0 victory over Palace. And it was a really tough four-out game. We're going to discuss all the ins and outs, what happened during that game, ranking the performances, talking about the goals, talking about the players, also talking about some of the talking points from the game, particularly that red card. So let's get into the intro and then we'll get straight in to it. This is my club. Fucking love this football club. Henri! What a goal! Gabriel Martinelli! He's scoring for Arsenal! Right, we're going to get straight stuck in. I'm going to start with uh, a bit more of a few, but before I do, uh, Arsenal obviously got that 1-0 victory since Roy Hodgson took over at Crystal Palace back in March. They've remained unbeaten at home, so that's their first defeat at home. A really hard-earned victory, super resilient from Arsenal, gutsy, a brave performance, and really that last 30 minutes with 10 men uh, made it difficult for us. And I, I wouldn't say we made it difficult for ourselves in that matter, but we played really, really well. Uh, Palace uh, kept the pressure on for those last 20 minutes. Really, we kept it super tight, really compact. Um, I don't think we really left anything for them in that game. So a really hard-fought victory. Um, I'm going to first go into uh, my rip and review, and that's going to be all about the lineup ahead of this game. Uh, I think uh, most of the talking points before the game started was the dropping of uh, Gabriel to the bench and and the reasons behind it. So obviously in our first game against Nottingham Forest, uh, Gabriel was dropped to the bench and it was said to be a tactical change um, in the fact that we could overload in midfield by having that extra amount of party inverting in that right back position. Now, the question stands, does it look tactical still? Or is there other reasons kind of behind? So there's, there's three things I kind of wanted to look at. Back in the Man City game in the Community Shield, Gabriel did take a little bit of a knock. And I wonder if Arteta has kind of learnt his lesson um, with regards to player protection and rotation. We've seen it in previous games where Arteta will probably uh, overplay players. We see it with Saka. I think Saka in this game in particular uh, joined a record with Paul Merson of playing uh, 82 games on the bounce, um, which I think was the stat. Do correct me if I am wrong. Um, but Arteta has uh, commonly overplayed players and, and it meant that they've had a lot of minutes in the legs and they do look uh, tired, lethargic, and, and the fatigue really does start to settle in, as we saw towards the uh, the end of last season. And so I do think there's an element that protecting Gabriel and bringing him back slowly if he had taken a knock against Man City is the right thing to do. Um, so that's one way you could look at it. The uh, second way that you could look at it is that we're gearing up for a sale and maybe his head isn't necessarily in for this game. There was talk uh, pre-kickoff that there is a Saudi club in talks with him. I'd be interested to hear what exactly is a price we would entertain um, with the injury to Timber. We're already now a little bit lighter at the back than we'd like to be, remembering that Timber was bought in and he was playing straight away in that left back position. And that's not even his natural uh, position. And so we, we definitely liked, and if we were to uh, sell Gabriel, I couldn't entertain anything less than 80 million, I would say. Um, with his tenure at the club, with his contract status the way that it is, with it being a Saudi club and with him being pretty much in his prime, I can't see any other value being entertained, particularly by Arsenal, who would need to replace him so late in the window. There are 10 days to go. Um, there are not uh, a smorgasbord of uh, centre-backs available um, that would necessarily bring our levels up. And I, I rate Gabriel. I know we've talked in previous pods of him having uh, a potentially a mistake inside of him, but I don't think that that should take away from 
um, his eagerness and vigor to defend the ball. He is a true defender at heart and he does uh, really well for us. I would say him and Saliba is our best centre-back pairing. And so I, I can't see us gearing up for a sale. Even if that 80 million was touted, I think it'd be really difficult for us to replace him and to really give us something that would, would be able to give us good coverage at our back uh, four. There is a third kind of way, and like I said, it could be tactical. And uh, by that, it kind of does allow us to shape up with a back three when we kind of play out. And it does allow us to overload that midfield. We're, we're more attacking. We're more progressive with the ball. And I do think that that style of play suits us against uh, lower end opposition. But I think that lower end opposition doesn't include Palace. I think Palace are a really good side. And it doesn't suit us away from home. And particularly at a ground like Selhurst Park, which is like well known to be a noisy ground. Their crowd were, were pretty much behind them for the full 90 minutes. Um, it's a bit of a cauldron uh, and it really did kind of put us on the back foot at times. And so I'm not necessarily sure that tactically wise it was the right way to set up, but I do kind of understand it. There was um, uh, a little uh, uh, image that I saw ahead of the game that did actually show us having two tactical setups depending on the availability of Zinchenko. And I would say that um, if Zinchenko was to play, then Gabriel would kind of sit back and we'd go back to that common back four that we saw a lot last season of uh, White, Saliba, Gabriel and Zinchenko. Um, but I would say that to my first point, the likelihood is that Arteta is learning a bit more about his game and is being a bit more astute in ensuring that players aren't rushed back in when they don't need to be and are also being able to ensure that we set ourselves up, even if we're not setting ourselves up for a win, we're setting ourselves up with a, a great deal of protection at the back. So those are the three kind of way. Um, I know I said three, I might add another one. Um, the other thing I was going to say is that I think that when we talked a lot in previous podcasts uh, about the unpredictability, about the flexibility, there actually was a quote from Arteta that I saw talking about, we have flexibility now to rotate and accommodate different options. And maybe this is as deep as it gets. Maybe this is exactly what we're seeing. We're seeing the trial and error right in front of us. Um, and that's not to say it's the, uh, the right time to do it. Myself and Jace have talked in previous pods about doing that potentially in uh, Carabao Cup games or in lower level uh, Champions League group stage games. But, you know, we're seeing it now. We do have a relatively easy run. We've got Fulham uh, next to a light on options. Um, so I wonder whether or not we would uh, do that again. They're lacking Paulinia. They're lacking uh, Mitrovic. Um, so it's potential that we see this set up again. And we start to see how it works. But I'm going to discuss a little bit in the pod about maybe some of the ins and outs of how um, this setup went. But for me, my River Room review, like I said, I dropping Gabriel again was an odd choice. Um, I am a big advocate and player of fantasy football. He is in my defence and it's a bit of a shame to see him dropped. And that's not the only reason I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed because I feel that when everyone's fit, he's on the team sheet. So... My feeling is that he he is not a hundred percent, and so we are protecting him while also trying out different systems. So uh, that's my rip run review. Uh, Going to move on a little bit to talk on some of the performances. There were a lot of different performances out there. Um, some none none bad. I wouldn't say anybody necessarily had a game where they stunk out the place and went missing, but there were certainly some varying levels of commitment throughout that game. I wanted to first talk a little bit about the, the fullback choices. Um, to start that game, we had uh, Tommy Yasu and we had Thomas Party, both naturally not their positions. And that did mean that our uh, dynamism going forward was lacking. I do feel that although we overloaded in midfield and had the ability to have more players around the ball when party does kind of invert and, and fill into that midfield position, what we lacked, um, what, what we had going forward, we certainly lacked in defensive capability. Um, and the, the times that Palace did go forward against us, I was uh, clenching my butt cheeks, let's say. Um, I was worried every time they went forward, they looked very dangerous, uh, particularly Eze Elise. They both looked particularly on it. Even Jordan Ayew, who I wouldn't necessarily say is, uh, well, he's got his best years behind him. 
um, even he had a relatively good game. And I don't think it was difficult to have a good game when you're playing against those fullback options. Like I said, naturally, that's not their position. And I think defensively, they're not as capable as our first choices. Um, so it was an odd uh, odd setup from a fullback-wise. So I think both of their performances, although Thomas Partey grew into the game, I do think he, he played some really incisive balls. He can always play those balls across the park in switching play. He did fantastically on uh, a few occasions. There was one uh, through ball in particular that kind of went really well for him. And like I say, going forward, he is much more... Uh, dynamic, much more agile, but he he can't go. He doesn't have the engine. And I, I wanted to talk on the lack of his engine to go into someone that does have an engine, and that's Declan Rice. Um, Declan Rice really did take uh, to this game. This this is the first game that I've watched of Declan Rice where I've came away and thought, you know what? Um, he's definitely going to come good. He really fit well within that system. His ball recovery was absolutely fantastic. The thing that really stood out to me from this game in particular of Declan Rice was his ability to command and be vocal on that pitch. There was occasions where you would see him directing traffic from the centre of the park, telling players where to go, where to stand, where they should go, where they should stay, how they should set up. Um, there's been a lot of talk pre him joining of his captaincy at West Ham and what role he would fit in within Arsenal. Now, obviously, Erdegaard is is our captain, and that's not to say that that will change, but I would say that what we've seen so far from Declan Rice is that he can be that voice. He's a really big, commanding presence in the centre of that pitch and really did um, do well to speak to the rest of the team, to bring them all into the game and to kind of really command his position. Um, he was so strong. He won a lot in the middle of the park. His ball recovery, like I've said already, was really fantastic. And I think that was the first time that I've you know, come away thinking that Declan Rice... Um, is, is it for us? Uh, and for me, he was one of the standout performances of this game alongside the next player. Um, I feel like we say this every time, uh, Bakayo Saka. Um, Saka just finding himself on the ball a lot, all the time down that right-hand side, um, significantly more than Martinelli. Um, he was being doubled up and tripled up every single time he had the ball and had space out on that wing, which does allow us to kind of take advantage of the spare uh, space and the lack of players that they have uh, in and around that box. It was unfortunate. I think the one time that he did cut inside and get a shot away, it was either directly at the keeper or a little bit wild. Um, so he didn't necessarily get off the shots that we've seen him get off in previous games. But once again, he is proving why he is one of the top wingers in the world. He is scary to play against. Um, every single club that we're seeing come up against us at the moment is effectively man marking him and then some um it's really uh you know I, I'm, I just can't understand how many games he plays how he stays fit for so long how he's able to last those games and play the way that he plays um i just really hope you know getting to the same numbers that he got to last season is going to be really challenging for bakayo saka I hope he can do it. And I think that there, there's, uh, I'm going to talk in the parking lot about some potential options there, but obviously we do not have a like for life Bukayo Saka uh, replacement. And it'd be so hard to come by anyway. Uh, it's never likely going to happen. You know, that that tier one and tier two players um, that we've mentioned in previous spots and Arteta called out, um, particularly in his press conference with uh, David Rea and Aaron Ramsdale, there was, you know, th there's, there's levels here. And Bakayo Saka is, is many levels above whatever understudy he has, whether that's Reese Nelson or potentially Nicola Pepe, who we'll talk a little bit about later. So he needs to stay fit. He needs to keep delivering. He needs to keep it on. And he's showing promise already in all of his games uh, so far. So, um, yeah, really want Bakayo Saka to keep it up. I did mention briefly Aaron Ramsdale in there, and I want to just give a big shout out to, to Ramsdale during that game did exactly what you need the keeper to do when he needed to kind of lay on the ball and protect the time and protect our lead. He did so when he needed to make saves. He did do, there was one nervy moment, I think, when he came out to collect the ball and he dropped it towards the, the 85th or 90th minute, somewhere in that range. Um, and he kind of spread himself very, very wide to put off the shot, which eventually did go skyward. Um, you know, had that gone in, we might have been saying something differently. But I think Aaron Ramsdale did enough here to showcase why he's our number one currently, why I don't think we should be dropping him. Jace asked me on the previous pod, who starts? Does David Rea start? And I, I collectively said no, and I still can't see that. 
um, being any different going into the Fulham game. The last player I did want to talk a little bit about was Kai Havertz. Um, the commentary team made a lot of points about he finds himself in interesting positions, yet not necessarily being able to do much with those positions. And I kind of agree with that. He did start the game relatively bright. He put some good ball into Martinelli, who, who couldn't necessarily score in the, the early goings of the game. He was able to also um, pick out some really good passes. And he wasn't winning much in the air, which is kind of what I always thought we were buying him for, to um, you know get those long balls up and win those high balls. And he wasn't necessarily doing that a great deal um, during this game. And I also think... The only thing I was going to add on the Kai Havertz performance here, although not fantastic, certainly less uh, lackadaisical compared to previous outings of our player there. Um, he has looked uh, low, leggy, lethargic in, in previous games, and I think I'd said maybe not bothered. Um, he certainly felt more bothered this game. He grew into it. He became more energetic as time went on. He was chasing down balls. Um uh, there was probably, um, he's probably lucky to get away uh, with the new rules, which I'll talk a little bit about later, with only one yellow card, which he actually got for kicking the ball away in the wrong direction, um, which is such an odd yellow card to pick up, but so be it. Um, I thought we'd get more and we didn't, but there was times during that game, particularly in that last 30 minutes where we needed to protect it and players were doing really tactical uh fouls time wasting etc um and so i think that that element to our game is something that we've never really had before that now and so i'm happy that it came into it and I'm, I'm glad that it didn't necessarily come to much in terms of cardage um we'll talk about uh the tommy Asu red card in a second um but generally speaking that kai performance was okay and i think that uh he could potentially grow into his position um, but yeah, some, some time will tell. I think he's going to have to get used to the system. He's going to have to get used to the way Arteta wants him to play. I don't think he's going to be getting away with not running around and making a nuisance of himself for very long, which is why I think that that came across much more uh, during this game than it had in previous games. Right, that's some of the performances I wanted to call out. There's obviously some people that I haven't mentioned. There are going to be some talking points coming up in uh, a moment. Uh, the first of which is oh, not that one it is going to be the result or the performance now we talked in our preview pod um about the results or the performance and which one of those two things uh is the the kind of right thing um i think both myself and jace both agree that it was the result that was key and i think looking back on that 90 minute game now we'd both kind of take it as well the performance for the first half was really really good um, and we, we performed really, really well. We controlled the game. We had the most possession. We didn't create very much, um, but we did create enough and we started to take more shots as the game went on. But obviously, as the latter part of the game um, came into play and the Tommy Asio red card kind of happened, then it obviously changed the way in which we, we played. I wanted to call out one, one player that obviously impacted the result the most, I feel, and that's Eddie Nketiah. Uh, Eddie and Ketia showed some really good composure, really good striker and all round kind of performance this game. Um, Jay's thoughts in our preview pod about this is the type of game that really suits Eddie's style of play and his performance that he would run around. He would make a nuisance of himself. He would get in the keeper's face. He would chase down balls. He would be part of the press. And all of that came to fruition uh, during this game. He put in a, a proper striker's performance, I would say. And that the real, the real shame with that is that it didn't result in a goal for Eddie, which I think he fully deserved, but never, never became apparent. There was occasions where he was unlucky not to score. He hit the post um, with a really good turn, really great composure. Maybe he took too many touches and had to kind of toe at it, um, which kind of hit the um, post. So that was unfortunate. Uh, Rice put him through on goal one-on-one -on -one, and he really should have scored in that one. I think um, we've talked previously about him maybe overthinking when he has time to consider his options and really um, uh, control in his mind about what he wants to do. He will overthink it and be too creative and too clever with uh, the what he wants to do. In this occasion, he tried to dink it over the keeper and he just dinked it far too hard. Um, I think it would have to have been an almost perfect dink to make it over the keeper and into the goal. So that was an unfortunate. But in the first half in particular, Eddie made things happen. 
Um, he brought players into the game. He was our, our most, I would say, creative player. Um, and he did everything else other than score right. And, you know, the penalty uh, that Erdogan scored came from, from Eddie and Martinelli. Martinelli took a really quick free kick. Eddie was uh, aware of that ball, jumped on it. He was in position. It doesn't matter if the ball was kicked away from him. It was a clear penalty, stonewall penalty, if ever I've seen one. Um you know, he deserved that. He played well to get it. He claimed it was quick thinking. And so, you know, 1-0 to the Arsenal from that. It was a great penalty from Erdegaard. And it all resulted from, from Eddie and Ketia. And, um, you know, there's been a lot of talk about who who's our number nine, who starts. And I think everyone probably agrees that when Gabby Jesus is fit and healthy, that he comes straight into this starting eleven. But Eddie consistently keeps doing enough to be that guy that gets us results, that is bringing us into games, that is, is you know, really giving us the results that we need. And so um, I feel kind of bad that so many people downplay Eddie and Ketia because he had a fantastic performance tonight. And I think that um, against Fulham next week, he's also going to do really, really well. It'd be interesting to see what happens when we come up against Man United at home the following week, because I wouldn't necessarily think that that is the game we, we've, I think we've seen Eddie and Ketia against Man United. And so I'm not necessarily sure that that's the right approach um, to that game. So, yes, the result for me was the most important. We did have a good first half performance, but all of that came to change in the second half, which I want to talk about in our next session, which is I've got new rules. Um, not the Dua Lipa song, uh, although I could call upon her to, to sing it if we wanted to. Um, have the, the new rules, have they ruined the game? And um, I wanted to just talk through a little bit about, obviously, uh, the, the segment of the game in which I'm talking about. At the 66th minute, uh, Tommy Yasu was sent off for a second yellow card. Uh, the second yellow card was given to him for a shirt pull. Um, the shirt pull looked like nothing in real time, um, a kind of usual uh, kind of tactical foul, I suppose. But in reality, when it replayed, it did look like there was fairly uh, innocuous and, and nothing really in it. And so it's a really it wasn't really checked as far as I could see. I'm assuming VAR did and it just wasn't shown on the screen. It does seem like a crazy second yellow to get considering the first yellow that he got uh, was uh, not even his time wasting. So Arsenal were. Time wasting. I don't think that the, the the way in which the shit housing of the rules has really manifested itself with the team's knowledge yet. Um, I'm sure it will over time. Um, but Kai Havertz wasted, I think, 15 seconds in taking that throw and passed it over to Tommy Asu, who wasted eight seconds in taking that throw, in, and he thus collected um, the yellow card. Now, let's say hypothetically that went the other way around. Anyway, Kai Havertz might have got sent off later on in the game uh, for his second yellow card. But I really wanted to call attention to whether or not we think that's a yellow card, I suppose, is I, I don't necessarily agree with it. I think the first one shouldn't have been given. Yes, the second one is a tactical foul. And in the old rules, I would have said that had a referee been asked that question after giving the first one for the foul throw up, uh, sorry, for the throw in and then going to that shirt pull, I don't think he would have given it. I, I think that uh, the way the new the new rules have kind of manifested themselves are making our referees much more gun ho in giving away cards. I would say that we seem to be, and uh, I was having a, a small amount of banter with a friend on text message in one of my uh, WhatsApp groups um, regarding uh, the 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 games gone. It, we seem to be more inherently bothered by people either wasting time, kicking the ball away, or or flashing their hands to give yellow cards to other players, rather than actually making our officiating better. Um, we have VAR. We don't use it. There was obviously a penalty shout later on in the game um, against Thomas Party. Um, in the past, we've seen them given the on-field decision was no penalty and thus VAR did not overturn it because there wasn't enough. The, the ceiling or the bar um, for overturning decisions has been said to be higher this season than in previous seasons and so wasn't given. And um, it just, I just don't understand it. We seem to have made some new rules to officiate really docile, mundane and, and innocuous things in the game. Things like time wasting, things like kicking the ball away, things like arguing with the ref and swearing at the ref, when really you should, we should be targeting our referees to just be better at officiating games. Um, they are just avoid of any kind of repercussion from their 
from their work. Um, we've seen against Wolves, uh, Man United game, for example, that they said, oh, you know, we're, we're going to not officiate the next game. Like, that, there's there's no repercussion for them whatsoever. They'll come back again. They'll officiate again. There's nothing that Howard Webb uh, takes back uh, in terms of the the acceptance and the criteria that he has to hold himself accountable for. Um, they've got no one to answer to. And it is really, for me, ruining the game a little. And, you know, if this if the shoe was on the other foot and I'd seen that, that um, Thomas Party foul on a Palace fan, I was a Palace fan, I would have been screaming. Yes, I think that in... If they had a look back on that and it was just a VAR decision, they would have given it. We are where we are, unfortunately. Like I said, most people will say that those things kind of even themselves out across the season. But for me, what should be happening is we just get better officials um, and better usage of VAR. And unfortunately, we've, we've not got to that point yet. And we seem to be misusing it for, for other nefarious reasons that I just can't understand. So when uh, Tommy Asu did get sent off, it obviously changed uh, the dynamic of this game completely. And that's where I wanted to talk a little bit about game management. Um, Palace had, I think, about 80% possession for that last uh, 30 to 25 minutes. They continued uh, to knock on the door. They continued to pile the pressure on Arsenal. It didn't necessarily result in a great deal of shots. I think their XG was uh, lower than ours. I think ours was two, so theirs was 1.3 or something along those lines. They didn't create very much. And I would say that our defensive uh, metal was tested uh, for sure during that last segment of the game. And I also feel that we, we did really well. You know, usually I'm quite nervy. If that was uh, any other uh, previous uh, Emery or latter uh, Wenger era um, game, I would have been hiding behind the sofa because we knew what was coming. And it's really interesting to see uh, the Chelsea West Ham game um, when they were down to 10 men. And it's felt like a different game altogether. It actually felt like Chelsea were the team um, down to 10 men, whereas in our game, it certainly did show that we had no outlet. Every time we would clear the ball, no one would be there to recover it. Every time we did kind of collect a foul and, and try to play out from the back again, um, we were unable to. We were really closed out. We had no options. We had no outlet. And it made it difficult to us uh, for us to play our game. But we did set up in a different way which is very unlike uh, us of old, I would say. We don't necessarily protect the leads very well. Even uh, when we were 2-0 up, uh, myself and Jace discussed how uh, this was against Forest, how we we don't close out games. We just let other teams in. And although we had no choice but to let other teams in during this game, I feel that we were really resilient. We were really well protected. We did really well in defending that lead and, and doing exactly what we haven't done in previous games. If that was, a, like I say, another season, I really do feel that Palace would have came in back into that game. And, you know, under the lights, Monday night against Palace, Selhurst Park, noisy ground. You know, that is a difficult result. Man City also scraped a 1-0 victory with a Haaland penalty in the same circumstances. So I really do think it tested our mettle um, and I'm glad that we came away. One thing I was going to mention on uh, how we managed the game towards the end was the substitutions. Um, obviously really defensive, and I think the latter substitution, particularly Shinchenko coming on and Kiwio coming on, when we started to see players play in their natural positions, we, we did feel like we were coming more into the game and playing our football, particularly Shinchenko. I've missed him so much. Uh, he did, obviously it's a very small uh, pool of minutes to kind of pick from and kind of understand exactly what he delivered in terms of his game. But he did fantastic when he came on. He was really driven, really um, aggressive in the press, really tactile in his passing and one-twos in really tight spaces between him, Jorginho. Um, and I think that when we had natural defenders in natural positions, we just seemed to be more uh, settled. Uh, and that's something that is just when I talked earlier about the fullbacks and who we chose as our fullbacks, um, it was odd. Uh, although it worked, obviously, in the end, we won 1-0. I would say that I'd, I'd love uh, for us to go to a settled back four of our common Gabriel Saliba, Zinchenko and uh, Ben White. Um, maybe not against Fulham. Maybe we'll experiment and continue with this party right back. But I would like to see that against Man United. I feel uh, party at right back against Man United will get roasted. Um, I don't think that's a, a recipe for anything but disaster. 
Right, so that's a bit about game management. Um, I wanted to, uh, there's a few little bits um, that I wanted to talk about in the parking lot before I sign off. Um, the first is, I mentioned it briefly earlier, Nicola Pepe is uh, back at London Colney. Uh, there was an Instagram post by him in the changing room. And there's talk that um, he could be potentially reinstated as our Saka backup. And how do I feel about his reintegration into the, the squad? If you watch any compilation video of Nicola Pepe, you'll come away thinking, oh, my God, he's one of the best wingers in the world. Um, he does score some fantastic goals and, and, you know, did do relatively well for us in spots. But his ability to go in and out of games is is was really telling. In a similar vein to Kai Havertz, he can feel lazy in, in the way that he plays. And I get the sense that his issues are probably more in his own head rather than the physicality of the game. Um, there's a, a, a crisis of confidence for sure. I get the sense um, that he he does uh, kind of sit in his own head a little bit and kind of not be able to play the way he wants to play. Um, and it's whether or not Arteta can get him working within this system. If I was to choose right now, I would say that Reese Nelson is the better backup. I think we've seen enough from Reese Nelson last season that he can do those last 20 minute stints when we want to close out games. And even when we don't want to close out games, he's been justifiable enough. I'm, I'm going to always call back to the Bournemouth goal because it's one of my favourites of last season and it's such a, an amazing moment. Um, so I'm not, I'm not too sure. And I, I do feel that reintegrating him into the squad over termination of his contract is probably the better thing to do. We give it another year. We see if he can play the part. We might be able to increase his value in the market because his his market right uh, right now is is probably relatively low, and I don't necessarily think there's enough in there that you'll get a good sale, which is why we have to look at termination because his his contract is just too hefty. But let's see where that goes. Like I say, I, I don't don't think um, Arteta is much of a forgiving individual and kind of gives second chances lightly. So it would be interesting to see. We've already seen as what we call the undesirables in the last few weeks, um, of which Balogun, Cedric Suarez, uh, Zambi Lukonga, Nuno Tavares are playing separately from the squad. It would be interesting to see where Nicola Pepe fits in, if it's with that or if it's with the first team and how he kind of hopefully kind of makes his way back into the fold. The last thing I wanted to talk about, which is a bit of a, you know, a difficult subject to talk about, and that's Mason Greenwood. Um, Obviously, uh, Man United issued a statement today of his um, decision that they will find him something away from Manchester United. So he'll no longer be playing for Manchester United and they'll be working with him to to find a um, alternative, whether that be in a new club in the Premier League or a new place altogether. It could be you know, abroad, Saudi Arabia, Italy or somewhere else. For me, ultimately, it's the right decision by the club. Um, but their statement just gave me extremely mixed uh, signals. It's a really odd one. They effectively said there was not enough evidence for them to suggest any wrongdoing, but Mason acknowledges the mistakes he has made. For me, those uh, two statements are relatively oxymoronic. Um, it's got to be one or the other. He either did what he did and he made a mistake and the club are going to you know, move him away from the club, or he didn't do what he did and they're going to stand by him. And at the moment, it feels like they want their cake and they want to eat it too. Um, they've, they've said he hasn't, he, he's not guilty, he hasn't done anything wrong, but we're also going to move him off. Those two things just don't stand well for me. I think the evidence is clear enough in his case that you could see all the wrongdoing. And it's wise for the, the club to distance themselves um, from the situation, but also just a fairly odd one in terms of the statement that it made. I think that um, a lot of this is bred from the backlash, from the leaks that happened, that there was talk of reintegrating him into Man United's fold. And I think after they'd seen the social backlash that that had caused, they they quickly U-turned, although they, they've they said that, you know, all of that was false. Um, I can't see any other world that that was um, a, a litmus test to see exactly what the waters would be like, and they were not good. Um, so I think it's the right decision by the club, but just a fairly odd one. And I'd be interested, you know, in other cases across football that are similar to this, what other clubs are doing and, and could do um, I think Gary Neville had said this on the um, the build up to the game when he was talking about Man United just didn't handle this very, very well. And it's uncharted territory for them and for others. They kind of need to rely on 
uh, other people that have done this, but this is not something just necessarily to do with football. This is to do with the world now. This is to do with people with power, with money, and how it's influencing decisions within um, life. And it's it's crazy to think where we've got to with this. Um, like I say, I, I, it's, it's right for Man United to do the thing that they've done and distance themselves, but it just feels like a, a really kind of mixed bag in terms of the, the statement that they've issued and how they've gone about their business. Right, that is a relatively short pod uh, from me. It's 35 minutes, so I'm going to let you go. But before I do, remember, if you're watching this on YouTube, we'd really appreciate any thumbs up, any subscriptions. If you've got any questions or comments on the pod, then please do put them in the comments. We will look to try and have a mailbag episode if you want to send us any questions uh, to answer those. And if you're listening on your podcast providers, do remember that if Jason was here, he'd be saying five stars, no less. Otherwise, uh, I'll be sending uh, someone round to kind of give you a strongly worded letter to uh, give me five stars, no less. Um, other than that, I hope you've enjoyed the pod. I hope you enjoyed Arsenal uh, giving a resilient and uh, dominating performance when it mattered. Um, really, really important to get those three points. There are only three teams now that are on six points, Man City, Brighton and Arsenal. So looking forward uh, to the Fulham game. I am on holiday uh, from Friday, so I'm heading off to Spain. Um, so myself and Jace will connect and see what's going to happen with the Fulham game. Hoping if I'm in Spain, I'll manage to catch a, a 3 p.m. kickoff. Who knows? So we'll be back to review that game and talk a little bit about where that leaves us ahead of Man United the following week. So thank you very much for tuning in and I'll speak to you very, very soon.